Hi, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome here. It's, it's an honor to stand here and welcome His Excellency Mr. Daniel Carman, Israeli Ambassador to India. Uh, it's also an honor to, uh, to receive and to welcome the Consul General of Israel in Mumbai, Mr. David Akoff. Uh, welcome to Pune and welcome to PIC. Of course, it's a it's very pleasant task to say welcome to all of you. Before we introduce the dignitaries on the dais, as a usual practice, uh, His Excellency may we introduce you to the, uh, to the attendees that we have in the audience. In the audience, we have members of Pune International Center who come from very different walks of life. There are journalists, economists, scientists, business professionals, business owners, entrepreneurs, faculty, students. We also have academic institutions of Pune and outside Pune as members of PIC. So some of the faculty members of those institutes and young and bright students are also here to attend the session today. And as we mentioned earlier, Pune uh, is a vibrant place when it comes to consuming anything uh, whether that include whether that is classical music or whether there is sessions like these uh, which are which are very informative and insightful uh, many many punekars would take active interest and would attend these so that's the audience that we have today it's an it's great that today we have on the dais the consul general of israel we also have dr vijay kelkar the chairperson of the program today and dr abhay firodia to begin with, may I introduce uh, Dr. Vijay Kilkar. I understand that there is very little that you all need in terms of introduction to Dr. Vijay Kilkar, but an honor that I, might, I, I may never miss. Dr. Vijay Kilkar very much studied here in Pune. Then he moved on to University of California at Berkeley to do his PhD. He has worked in Planning Commission, Commerce Ministry, Economic Advisory Council, Petroleum Ministry, of course, as the finance secretary in government of India in 1998, in the IMF, chairman of the finance commission, the 13th finance commission in the rank of union cabinet minister, the same commission that was once also chaired by Sri Yashwantrao Chavan, the Yashwantrao Chavan Academic Development Academy, where, which is where we are, we are hosting this program today. He has been advisor to Ministry of Finance, he has been advisor to various other ministries. I think that's going to be a session in itself. So I'll just stop there and I'll mention that in 2011, Dr. Vijay Kelkar was bestowed Padma Vibhushan, the second highest civilian award for distinguished and exceptional service to the nation. In one line, if I were to introduce Dr. Vijay Kelkar, Dr. Vijay Kelkar is vice president of Pune International Center. Well, Prashant, even the better line would be that I'm married to Rahul Dravid's sister. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I almost forgot to mention, uh, in PIC, there is no penalty for clapping when you feel like. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's great to have uh, Dr. Abhay Firodia here on the dais today. Dr. Firodia, as you all know, is the chairman of Force Motors Limited. The mass in terms of volume of activities added with an acceleration over the last few decades is what force today is uh, without necessarily going into the physics of it. <laughs> As a chairperson of force motor, what he has done in terms of the job growth in Pune as well as uh, growth of force motor is very well evident to all of you. But I must also mention significant contribution of Dr. Firodia in shaping the automotive industry in itself. And that's through various councils, various associations. Dr. Abhay Firodia was president of the Society of Indian Automobiles Manufacturers, CM. He was the president of Automotive Research Association of India, ARAI. He was the president of the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce, IGCC. He was the president of Automotive Component Manufacturers Association of India, ACMA. And also president of Maratha Chamber of Commerce, Industries and Agriculture. So apart from 
shaping a force motor he has had significant contribution in shaping shaping the auto industry in itself in the country talk about pune's leadership you know just so that you have a few more bullet points to talk about it when you next mention about <laughs> pune's leadership last but not the least there are many many awards uh, and recognitions dr firodia has received but i guess again it will take lot longer to mention those it suffice to say they are to do with stellar success in force motors the contribution in industry as well as many many social initiatives where he has taken very active interest with that prachan sir you forgot the most important role of uh, please dr fiore he was a founder trustee of the pic and in fact one of the midwives because he was the president of maharashtra chamber of commerce and many of our initial meetings took place in his office when we were planning for pic yeah true Again, no, uh, Dr. Kerker, the midwife plays only an observer's role. Mostly. <laughs> <laughs> But critical, though. Uh, and I was about to mention in one line again. The introduction is uh, Dr. Avay Firodia is a trustee of Pune International Centre. With that, uh, may I request Dr. Avay Firodia to please give his opening remarks and also introduce the honoured guest we have today, the guest speaker, His Excellency Mr. Daniel Karmanso. Dr. Avay Firodia, please. Excellency Dr Karman Mr David Akaov Consul General of Israel in Bombay Dr Vijay Kerkar Mr Girmane and ladies and gentlemen it's indeed a pleasure to uh, introduce ambassador Daniel Karman uh, to the audience and to pune per se he combines many many qualities in one person a career diplomat not a diplomat by having attained a certain position in some profession but by training in diplomacy uh, and international relations and then having served in many important positions in the israeli diplomatic uh, activity but before that as a young man he was a paratrooper in the israeli defense forces uh, and therefore has both the soldier's knowledge of the geography and the strategist's instinct for what that geography is capable of and what the issues are he has uh, been part of the very famous camp david negotiation which was one of the most uh, important and well known sort of turning points in the middle east's uh, geopolitical setup he has served as the ambassador of israel to the united nations and it's a privilege for india to have a person with such an insight and such a world view uh, having also previously served in the embassy in washington to be an ambassador for india at a time which is most important and opportune indo israeli relationship is flowering by the day time was when uh, there was a very uh, frosty silence or some sort of a distance between india and israel and people always wondered as to why because there is so much congruence between uh, the national interests of these two entities there is so much common history not common history in the terms of having been interactive but common factors in history similar challenges geopolitical challenges challenges of uh, neighborhoods both live in dangerous neighborhoods both are nations which are founded on the knowledge society indian history you can go back a few thousand years and trace back and india's ethic india's instincts are based on knowledge society and so are israel's both india and israel have ever been peaceful israel is not known to have suo moto attacked anybody 
both have had to defend themselves against hostile neighbors. But the way Israel has done it is something which is astonishing and which is a lesson for many, many people. The questions before the two nations are very similar. Israel utilized a combination of their intellectual caliber, the knowledge society that they have, the technological capability that they have developed out of this knowledge society, the technocrats that they have built, the strong military and security complex that they have created, and above all, the business instincts and the practical view, the Marathi word for it is the Vyavahar. Vyavahar is something the Jewish state understands what is the right thing to do, what is advantageous to society, not m just right in moral terms, but right in terms of strengthening your economy, strengthening your nation, strengthening your society. So they have used this to their advantage, and we in India also want to do that. We have in common the Dnyanamarg, but we need to understand from them how they have utilized their nyan in order to resolve their problems. Problems of water, problems of agriculture, problems of defense, problems of security. Security is different from defense. And problems of economy. Can you imagine a country, if you exclude the West Bank, the waste of the country is, I'm told, only 40 miles wide. So a country which is so vulnerable, sitting amongst a hostile neighborhood, the climate of the country is nothing to clap about. You don't have uh, greenery, but they have utilized every drop of water. They have made agriculture sensible, not just productive. It is productive through being sensible. To give you an example, they don't grow crops which are water intensive. They grow crops where they are able to utilize the scarce water resources they are, but they grow them with fantastic technology deployment. The number of sensors in one Israeli field for agriculture probably exceed on a s square kilometer basis the number of sensors deployed in one of the new uh, high technology factories in India. So that is the level of technology intervention they have brought into agriculture to get yields which are astonishing, path-breaking research. So you see in Israel a combination of the intelli intellectuals, the, which means the academia, the scientists, the innovators. You see the business, the banks, the investment funds, which are internationally connected. In Israel, trade is free. And the availability of international capital and the interaction with international capital is very high, very secure, is very confident. And on the other hand, they have deployed all this for urban development. When you are in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, you think that you are in a European or American environment. I was astonished the first time I went there that I did not see in Tel Aviv a single gun in three days. I always thought that Israel must be crawling with soldiers with guns on the shoulder. You don't see them. That's because of their security system. So this combination of various technologies have given them the society that is secure, that is prosperous, that is progressive, and that cares for its citizens. You can go to a kibbutz. You can go to a university. They are very low on formality, but very high on achievement. And so there is a lot that India can absorb, particularly the city of Pune, which has large defense establishments, which has a large number of defense people. We have industry. We have academia. This connectivity that they have built is something which is path-breaking and we need in, in India and in Pune 
to be able to do that. And I've always felt that somehow Israel and India are made for each other. Israel needs a strategic depth of sorts. The Indian market, the Indian economy, the Indian population, which is friendly, which is not divisive by nature, can offer such a strategic depth. And India needs a strategic edge. Israeli technology, and I'm not talking of military technology alone, agricultural technology, electronic technology, defense technology also, all of this is something which can be of very, very great use. We are very fortunate to have uh, the ambassador here today, uh, and uh, he's going to talk about the future of uh, the relationship on the perspective of what our 25 years of relationship has been and what the next 25 years can be. I'm sure it's going to be very enlightening for all of us because come to think of it, India and Israel have to strengthen their mutual bonds, whether it is in industry, whether it is in agriculture, water treatment, defense, social activities, education, because we can only help each other. And in India, we have always had a very wonderful and open atmosphere to the Jewish people. The Jewish people have been present in India for millennia, for 2,300 years, we have presence here of Jewish people. I have not seen any discrimination in India in the last 70 years that I have memories of against the Jews. On the contrary, the Jews have made such fantastic contribution. There was General Jacob, there was Mr. David Sassoon, so many of them have contributed so much to Pune, to Indian military, to Indian history, and I do believe that the strengthening of the relationship between the, these two countries is going to be very beneficial to us, and let us hope that this does happen. I would say welcome, Ambassador, and we look forward to your wise words. Thank you. As you all, are, you all are aware, it's been 25 years since the establishment of diplomatic relationships, and Honorable Prime Minister would soon be visiting Israel. Uh, with the backdrop of that, it indeed is very, very timely, and it's an honor to hear none other than His Excellency Mr. Daniel Carman, the Ambassador of Israel to India. So. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to all. It's a real privilege for me to be here today in Pune. It's a privilege for me to be here in PIC. I want to start uh, my remarks uh, by a vote of thanks, which is usually left to the end of, uh, but there will be a, a, a ceremonial <laughs> and a real official vote of thanks, but I do want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, I have to say that uh, with Consul General Akov, uh, from whom I heard so much about Pune, so much, we have decided a few months ago that we have to make that happen, and we have to make this visit happen, and I'm so glad that we are uh, succeeding in this. So. Thank you, Consul General, for uh, making that happen. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, this acclamation has another reason, maybe you don't know yet, <laughs> but Consul General uh, Akov, and that's good news and not so good news. General Akov will be, General, Consul General Akov will be uh, finishing his term in a few weeks after a brilliant tenure in Mumbai in which he did uh, unprecedented uh, things for the uh, relationship between um, uh, Israel and Maharashtra. Uh, and he will be uh, living uh, not only with great achievements, but there will be, a, I'm sure, many people who will be missing him. I will be missing him for sure. But I know that uh, you will be a good ambassador of Maharashtra uh, in Israel. So thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Kelkarf and Mr. Girbane, 
And Dr. Ferodia, I want to say something special to you. We have met a few months ago in a very interesting seminar that we held in uh, Delhi, and thank you for participating. Your participation was uh, invaluable. Uh, your words, your introduction words, uh, comprehensive, friendly, the description of the Israel, the Indo-Israel relationship, the warmth, is very, not, more than just appreciated. I think that not only did you make my job easier, because uh, you did really a tour d'horizon of uh, what we have at stake, but you really did uh, point out uh, very important things in those very special relations between India and Israel. And one thing I did take from, I took, I took a lot from your words, but one thing I, say, I, I did hear loud and clear, India and Israel are made for each other. And I think, <laughs> and thank you. And I think that if we bear this in mind, uh, we, we will see that not only it is a right thing, it is something that is the platform on which we can build upon the future. We have a lot to be proud about in our achievements during the last 25 years. And many of you are witnessing, many of you are very knowledgeable about the details of those relations. And as we celebrate 25 years of diplomatic relations, and it's, uh, it's a date, it's an event, but it's, it's, it's symbolic, but it also gives some strength to the fact that th those two nations, those two countries, both receiving their independence in 47 and 48 from the British, with the British heritage that both of us uh, were left with, with uh, complicated neighborhoods, as you have said, with complicated, respective neighborhoods, with complicated uh, uh, challenges of building a nation or building nations from scratch, in, in, in our case for sure, uh, with the challenges of development, of health, of education, with um, uh, geopolitical uh, challenges from the point of view of Israel with a very narrow, as you mentioned, a very narrow strategic uh, territory to be uh, f fighting for when attacked. And as you know, we were attacked a day after announcing our independence. All of this puts us uh, on, a, on a very very special table, common table of relations between India and Israel. And I would like to give you a little perspective, not so much a historical perspective, but a perspective as seen today, uh, 25 years after uh, we started our diplomatic relations. I think that we all know that the relations started a little earlier, but they were not, they were, they were even less visible than, than after 92. Um, those, rela those relations, as I've said before, have uh, uh, evolved uh, from, from scratch, from uh, a time in which India was very much involved in the non-aligned world, a leader of the non-aligned world, still is a leader, but I think that the world has changed. And during the last uh, few years, uh, what we have had 70 years ago, or 50 years ago, or 25 years ago, the world have cha has changed, the world has evolved. Um, this has uh, permitted uh, us to get closer together. This has permitted us, and I, and I have to say, one of, one of uh, uh, the, uh, something that I bear in mind when I look at Israel's stand with the world, is that in the 50s or the 60s, and it, it's something very visual that I, I, I can remember because I was, as a kid, offended to see that, nationally offended as a seven-year-old kid, right, is this notion of an Israeli diplomat walking in, for example, the halls of the United Nations, and all the Arab diplomats or princes or leaders walking out. This was the exemplification of something that Israel has suffered from 
during the first years of independence. But this also has changed. In our region, where the equation was Muslims and Jews, Israeli and Arabs, good guys and bad guys, depend who you were talking to, of course. Uh, this has changed dramatically. The choreography, the architecture of world politics have changed. The Berlin Wall is no more. Uh, Non-aligned movement is weakened. Um, um, Israel started doing what it did not do in the first years, which is to look east. We did not look east for various reasons. We were looking west only. U.S., Western Europe, we had some interests, uh, uh, developmental interests in Africa. We had good relations with Latin America. We hardly look east. And because of various reasons, we started doing so in the 90s. We were fortunate enough that there were some, some global changes happened and the, what we call east looked at us and both China and, and India um, uh, opened up diplomatic relations within four days of each other in uh, 1992 for various different reasons, but it happened on the same week. And what started in 1992 very quietly under the radar, and I don't want to use harsh words be beyond under the radar because some do use um, other phrases. Um, what started then in 92 with great uh, hopes from both sides, uh, dwelling on a lot of interest, lot of curiosity, intrigue. People were intrigued on both sides, both leaders, people, <clears throat> what we call today civil society, defense establishments, etc. Very intrigued to open up these uh, relations and put content in the relations. In the first years, and you know, the non-aligned policy, and you all uh, are familiar with, um, with the development and with the policy at the time, uh, for the first f few years, more than just few years, the relations, the content of the relations was very very positive, very good, very instrumental for both sides, but we had the price to pay. And the price that we had to pay, and we accepted paying it, was the price of visibility. So relations evolved, and I have to say, especially in the defense field, but not only in the defense field. But we were asked, kindly asked, and we kindly accepted uh, to pay a certain price tag. The price tag in the eyes of a diplomat, and I was witnessing this uh, throughout my career, was that behind the scenes we had great contacts with the Indian diplomats, and it doesn't matter which party was in power, was it Congress or was it BJP, uh, we always knew we could rely on the Indian diplomats, but quietly behind closed doors under the radar, under instructions. Um, and I have to say, if, if I look at, if I, if I speak today about the, that time, we did not like it, but we knew that this is the price we had to pay. At the time, still, uh, there was uh, this uh, policy of India towards uh, West Asia which India did not hide, but of course we could not, uh, we, we did not do anything against it because we could not do anything against it because of this price tag phenomenon. Uh, this has changed, and this has changed in, uh, not only in 92 when uh, diplomatic relations were uh, initiated, but it has changed during the years where more and more content uh, came to the table, to the joint table, when defense was not the only game in town, when uh, Israel as a country that I can definitely say is a development laboratory in which in our own experience and exercise of nation building, we have learned how to 
do security and food security, health and education. Uh, of course, we were helped by some friends, but much of what we did, building this vibrant economy that you mentioned, building this very normal country, anyone who visits Israel understands and sees and is very much impressed by the fact that notwithstanding what you hear about Israel, especially in the Western media, what you hear about Israel uh, is not what you see when you are in Israel. I appreciate very much what you said about the guns in the streets. When I was in the 70s a soldier, uh, you, you would see more guns in the street or more people in uniform in the street because we did not sophisticate, let me say that, that way, the fact that, and, and we did not understand the fact that this also makes a difference. Now there are no, no soldiers in the street. Uh, the, you, you see less soldiers uh, hitchhiking. You would see tons of people uh, on the roads. This was uh, the way of, of our soldiers to get back home from their camps on Saturday. So you would see soldiers with uniform and guns, not necessarily because they were guarding the city of Tel Aviv, but because this was their way to go home on Friday. Nowadays, things have changed. The, this very normal country called Israel, the, this very vibrant society, vibrant parliament, vibrant economy, uh, hubs and hubs uh, of uh, uh, innovation, uh, a thriving agriculture, uh, startups uh, all over the country, uh, cyber uh, parks and uh, industry, Israeli, sti Israeli sti style industry, which is not a very heavy industry, but definitely a very important industry, which we are very proud of, is filling the country. And this country, in the same time, struggles for its uh, peace and security, and on the other hand, uh, struggles to make the citizens live in a, not only in a normal country, but in a thriving country, a developed country. And when it comes to Israel's relations abroad, and again, I would like to speak in the perspective and with the spectacles of a diplomat, the discipline of diplomacy has changed dramatically. When I think of what did I do, what were my priorities, what were the priorities of the Israeli MFA uh, a few decades ago, and I have to admit I'm, I've been with the Foreign Service for a few decades, totally different. The relationship was all, almost line to line, MFA to MFA. Only politics, policy, a little bit of commerce, business here and there, but we were, I would say, almost afraid to touch this thing called business. We were diplomats. Diplomacy has changed dramatically. Nowadays, diplomacy deals, and you have here three diplomats in this room, uh, uh, Consul General, advisor uh, Adva and Bilshinsky, and we have our colleague from the consulate, Anai. They know, we know, that today's diplomacy deals with the politics, with the MFA, with the marshes, with uh, votes in the United Nations, uh, and that's of course, continues to be the crux of our work. But nowadays, uh, diplomats deal with everything and they work with civil society and with business people and in India, not only with India, but with the states, very important. And it took us time to understand how important it is to work with states and not only with the capital. Delhi, which is a great place to serve in, that's not India. And this is why our it is India, but it's, that's, that's not the only thing in India. <laughs> and when we look at our agenda, when we look at our priorities, 
and this is something that uh, my predecessors have integrated into the service, is to do a lot of field, uh, uh, a lot of field work. So it's not only going every morning to the MEA and asking what's new, guys, but to go to, uh, to the states to uh, put in the joint table not only what is important for us explaining our policy to the other side and listening to India's policy, which we are doing anyway, but to look at the priorities of India, the reforms of the government of India, the necessities of India, and to see how do we match, m make the match, and how do we demonstrate the fact that India and Israel are made for each other. And in this context, and I'm sure that many of you are very knowledgeable about the relationship because this is what I find in every conversation that I have with people uh, of knowledge, of general knowledge, there is a very big and accurate, up to the last detail knowledge of the relationship between India and Israel throughout the years. And people tell me stories, unbelievable stories, about what happened with the date and with the hour that has to do with the relations between India and Israel. This, for me, is a sample of the fact that those relations are not just you know, another type of bilateral relations between India and, and, and some other country. And it is on the priority of the Indian government. It is something that many books have been written about and will be uh, written about. And uh, as we have talked, Consul General and myself, more than one time, to be here in India serving Israel, but also serving India and Israel, is one of a dream, uh, or diplomats' dream come true. And uh, especially during those uh, years <coughs> when the relations became more and more visible, when the content of the relations are wide widening and more and more, when uh, uh, an Israeli ambassador or Israeli consul general has to understand uh, more than basic terms in business, in entrepreneurship, in innovation, in agriculture, in water, because this is the message that we are bearing. We are not coming and opening a debate and then giving a few remarks and then giving the agronome or the water expert the, the you know, we, we are the new kind of diplomacy, and this new kind of, of diplomacy is demonstrated more than anywhere else in India. And with India, we have, back home in Israel, the biggest agricultural project abroad of Israel is here in India. A project by an agency called the Mashav, which is the International Development Cooperation Agency of Israel, that together with India, it's not foreign assistance, it's development cooperation. Together with India, we have built up to now 15 and until the end of the 25th year of diplomatic relations, we hope to get to 25, but we'll probably get to 20, uh, centers of excellence that are demonstration centers, training centers, centers for capacity building, for training the trainers, where India puts in the center, the land, in, and Israel, the, 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 the hardware, if I may say so, and Israel brings the technology, the experience of being a development laboratory back home, and this experience is cut, adapted, and pasted to India together with India. And those centers are really something you should visit. And if you haven't visited, please do. I think uh, that there is one center close by to Pune Rahuri. in Rahuri, which is uh, Rahuri. yeah, yeah. Uh, three more centers in uh, in Maharashtra. A few more centers in Gujarat, Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab. We are now expanding uh, our presence uh, with the centers of excellence. We are also going 
one step further, not only you know, felicitating ourselves on the success story of those centers, but we are also going one step ahead, which is to bring more technology, uh, to build more centers, and to integrate the private sector. And uh, we had the meeting this morning with the chief minister, and this is one of the areas of concern and one of the areas that we would like to develop in our relations with Maharashtra and with India, which is agriculture and beyond, and beyond what we're doing today. I'm not supposed to talk about the visit of Prime Minister Modi to Israel because it has not been announced yet. <laughs> But um, Prime Minister Modi said a couple of uh, months ago that uh, he will be visiting Israel in July, so who am I to say <laughs> that he is not, right? Uh, so the visit by Prime Minister Modi, the ex sorry, the expected visit by Prime Minister Modi in the next few weeks or months in July, uh, the, the, the expected <laughs> visit of uh, Prime Minister Modi to Israel will reflect the fabric of the relations between India uh, uh, and Israel. And as we are now preparing uh, this visit together with our uh, Indian colleagues, um, the fabric of those relations are exactly that. What we have been doing during the last 25 years and what we want to do in the next 5, 10, 15, 25, 50 years, which is to find the common grounds. We do not come to India with heavy industry or with heavy finance. We know our limitations, but we know our strengths. And our strengths are seen when you come and visit Israel and you see the technology and you see the companies and the startups and the innovation and the universities and what a student can uh, get when he goes to our universities, and we're very proud of the fact that 10% of the foreign students in Israel are from India. This is remarkable. This is remarkable. <laughs> so this will be reflected uh, uh, in the visit, but this will be reflected also in, um, in the time that we will witness after the visit. I think that one phrase that we use in Hebrew, maybe in other languages too, when you don't know exactly what to say about something, you say, the importance of this meeting is in the fact that this meeting was held. <laughs> now, this, uh, this phrase is always true if you mean it. I think that to say to all those who have been following Indo-Israel relations during the years, very unique, very special, as I said before, very intriguing um, um, uh, relations that have evolved so much during all those years, even before speaking about the content of this visit, the expected visit, of course, um, the importance of the visit in, is in the fact that for the first time an Indian Prime Minister is going to visit Israel. And this is huge. <laughs> this is really, really uh, huge. And one more thing uh, I would like to mention before I close, go uh, and sit uh, on the dais and will await your questions, if you will is to mention the Jewish community and the bridge that the, Jewish commu the, the Jewish community has always uh, held between our nations. As you said, you don't remember in 70 years uh, any persecution and uh, maltreatment of Jews as opposed to many other countries uh, around the world where Jews have suffered and uh, have suffered a lot. Uh, I think there is no record of any of such persecution in India. This is something that we cherish. And it's even more important when I say it in Maharashtra, where in Maharashtra uh, the Jewish uh, community is the biggest, was and is the biggest. And this also will be reflected in the expected visit by Prime Minister Modi when he will be uh, meeting uh, thousands of Israelis from origin, from Indian origin who are proud 
of this origin. So it's an important f factor in the relations between the Jewish people and the Indian uh, people between the states of Israel and uh, the Republic of India. And in this light, I would like uh, to thank you for your attention and be very glad to start some kind of an interactive uh, session, if you will, and try, try to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador has kindly agreed to take questions. Now, we are going to follow discipline. In, uh, so please keep questions brief. No statements, only questions. And uh, don't repeat the question if it's uh, asked earlier. So, Anand? I'm uh, Kamuto Khandekar. Uh, many thanks for a wonderful and sincere lecture, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, how do we build very strong partnership? That's the term which you have used in your interview in Financial Times. Between young entrepreneurs of Israel and young entrepreneurs of uh, India, uh, for India, I'm, I'm reading now Pune. Pune is an entrepreneurial town, uh, as Mr. Akhav must have uh, mentioned to you. Uh, we have equation with uh, the universities, uh, TAU, um, uh, with Ben Gurion and Bar Elan. So we really want to connect up the uh, young entrepreneurs in the startups in Pune with that of the universities in Israel. How do we do that with some kind of uh, uh, mechanism to make it happen fast? And I think I'm going to request Dr. Firudia to head the mechanism from the Pune side, if, 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 I, if I may. Uh, just one last line. Um, Pune uh, has got three key DNAs, entrepreneurship, uh, leadership, and knowledge. This city has ruled India for more than 100 years, as you know, uh, taking on the might of the Mughal Empire. So it's a different kind of city than what you've seen in India. I think you, I think you, touched, you touched upon a very important point uh, in one of the areas that we would like to strengthen. Uh, the relations uh, between India and Israel throughout the years have been characterized with content, ever-growing content uh, all the time, content in various fields. But the perception of those relations, this is what we hear, uh, and it is changing, and we have to make it change even more. The perception is that it is based mostly on the um, silent, low-key, low-volume uh, defense relationship. That's a well-known fact. Uh, without minimizing or evading or underestimating the importance of those relations, and they are important, we have, we have to try, and we are trying, to diversify, to put other areas of common concern and common interests not only shared values, but also shared solutions on this uh, very important table that we call the table of relations. And academia, and connectivity, and knowing each other much better because we don't know each other enough. What we know is relatively limited. It's limited to the youngsters who come and uh, visit uh, um, India after their military service, and there are lots of those. And I'm glad for each and every one of those youngsters who come and visit Israel because 20 years from now, those youngsters will be entrepreneurs and CEOs, and they will remember, yes, 20 years ago I was in India, and this uh, I, I could take myself out of India because I had to start my life, but I cannot take out, uh, India out of, uh, out of me. And that's true. People do say that. <laughs> On the other hand, many defense people who, when they were in service here in India, they knew the Israeli counterparts and they really enjoyed the partnership. And when they go one step beyond being in the army and they go into the uh, uh, entrepreneurship and open companies or manage companies and they become high level uh, um, uh, businessmen, they also remember, yes, I had this contact with uh, people in the Israeli DRDO or Air Force or 
or whatever. This is limited. This is relatively limited. It's important, but it's relatively li limited. So connectivity, more tourists, more agreements, if you are talking about a mechanism, more agreements, more MOUs, more university people from Israel, and that's one of our efforts to bring more universities. And I have to say that if we compare nowadays to 10 or 15 years ago, uh, we have much more interest from the Israeli side, Israeli universities, to make not only to uh, attract Indian students to come and visit in Israel, but to, to attract research and joint uh, papers and joint activities. And talking about the mechanism, there are a couple of mechanisms that will be either uh, announced or uh, launched in the next few weeks. At the end of the day, all of those which enrich the, not the content of the relations, but the venue and the areas that are tackled will bring us to a position where the relations, political, diplomatic, commercial, people to people, business to business, innovator to innovator, startup to startup, ecosystem to ecosystem, will be much more natural and much more of a routine. And not like today, because like to, today, I have to say, and I hope I'm not making a grave diplomatic mistake by saying it, I think that today we still bear some complexes from the past. Some. And if I may use a harsh word, the normalization of the relations between India and Israel has not terminated yet. We are still in the process of normalizing our relations. We are very satisfied. We can, you know, we can clap to each other and, and, and felicitate uh, ourselves of, for the great achievements, but we still have a step to go, and the visits by presidents, both presidents who visited each other, the number of universities who brought their uh, presidents here and there, uh, the number of um, Indians who go uh, to seek uh, uh, business with Israeli companies in agriculture, in pharma, in defense, um, um, is, is, is immense. The interest by Indian companies to acquire small uh, Israeli startups and to grow with them, all of these are dots. And if I can take from another place that we are talking about, connecting the dots is very important. So each and every dot maybe that will not do it, but all of them together will make this fabric that we all want. And if I may have a little vision and a little wish to us all, all those for, which, for whom the relations between India and Israel are important, and I think that that's a big majority, I'd like to be in a position where in five or 10 years, in this continuing ascent of Indo-Israel relations and all the importance that it bears for both countries, governments, and people to look back and to look back not only on those 25 years that we are now celebrating, but on the five or 10 or 15 years from now in which we will look at this period of time, this particular period uh, in which we are uh, upgrading uh, strongly uh, and enthusiastically up upgrading, upgrading our relations. Thank you. And in this regard, certainly uh, youth from, in, from Pune and <coughs> youth from India need to be visiting Israel in great numbers. Israel has India <coughs> as the, or, or the, the biggest tourist destination for Israelis worldwide it is India. Israeli tourists come to India in very great numbers, and they go to many places. Indian tourists do not go in great numbers to Israel. Let me tell you, Israel is a wonderful place for a holiday. After having been there on a few business visits, I went on a holiday visit for eight days. It's the most entertaining, most comfortable holiday. So for the people who are already advanced in life, and for the youth, for both, there is a lot of opportunity to make friends with Israel and to learn about the lifestyle and the values of Israel. It is the values that we need to take. Their values of 
applying themselves of academics involvement in industry and many many other areas so i think it is this people to people contact for youth and for business executives that is going to be very important and for farmers the biggest impact israel can have is on india's farming economy and it will transform indian rural society if we can follow what they are doing so we need to build these we don't today have a mechanism for creating this interaction and it would be important to do that thank you <clears throat> i am bh shrikant yeah. of pune okay this issue uh, is in the context of the uh, food security versus fuel security which is haunting the whole world okay israel is depending upon opec countries for its crude oil and petrochemicals okay. like india to reduce our dependence for diesel and petrol on opec countries government of india has started massive program for biodiesel and ethanol biofuels to run our automobiles okay since israel agriculture land is limited in near future how israel is going to tackle this problem okay of food security versus fuel security fuel means automobile fuel like diesel and petrol uh, i cannot contest what you said about the uh, trend towards which the world uh, is 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 going uh, to and through uh, israel is uh, almost totally self sufficient in the area of food security i think that the only uh, area that we really uh, import uh, are meat products probably all the rest uh, especially all the products in agriculture are, are products that we are Uh, self-sufficient with, and this has to do with um, with the technology that we have uh, developed in the field of energy. Despite the fact that we are part of a very uh, rich natural resource um, region, uh, we were not fortunate enough to have uh, what our neighbors have, which is uh, uh, oil and petrol. and they've definitely used it uh, and rightly so commercially and maybe not so rightly so politically uh but we were fortunate enough a few years ago to discover gas uh, offshore uh, of Israel and this has become a game changer in our economy both in our um uh, economy as such uh, and also in our uh, energy dependence so we're still energy dependent and we will continue to be energy dependent for a while uh, but things have changed uh, in israel also i don't see that this crisis that you uh, mentioned uh, will affect us uh, too quickly in israel our economy is a small economy uh we are very much integrated in world european us economy you haven't asked the question but i will answer the question i i'll be very glad if we could advance with india in the field of uh, giving more incentive to business from both sides to do business in the other country for example a free trade agreement this would be very beneficial for uh, both our countries and a few other mechanisms talking about mechanism a few other mechanism that at this time lack because there are impediments on uh, one side or sometimes on the other side or sometimes uh, on both sides um to 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 implement and since we are talking about india and israel uh, and since we are very happy about the uh, the connection and the contact and the achievements and the success story i think that in all areas there is a lot that we can gain the potential is continues to be huge and in the field of business any kind of business we could do much better and we should do much better uh, with more incentives between between both our economies and to those who say that there are other considerations and people do say that there are other considerations and we know that other <coughs> negotiations uh, between india and other countries are not uh, advancing too much for various reasons i say our economy is small and any agreement or any special mechanism with israel will not affect others so i hereby invite uh, once again uh, india uh, and israel and in our internal conversation we definitely talk with our government about it to uh, do more so that more business can be done between our uh, two countries good evening sir
This is Pratibha Chandran. I am a journalist. After the visit of uh, the proposed visit, as you say it, of the Indian Prime Minister to Israel, do you foresee some very important cooperation in the field of defense? Because there, mutually, both the countries uh, can have important deals, rather, or a lot more cooperation, because the concerns for both the countries are the same. If I tell you yes, then it, be, it will become a headline. He will tell you, you no, you will say, how come there's such a <laughs> strong uh, I, would, I would say that the, the visit, the expected visit, will deal with all the fabric of the relations between both countries. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying, you know, I'm trying. <laughs> and in general, and I'm not surprising you, and if I'm surprising you, pl please let me know, because then I'll try to. <laughs> we are usually not talking about our defense relationship for good reasons for both sides. So I think if we can keep it that way, but you know, as we say in Israel, according to foreign sources, <laughs> So, according to foreign sources, but the, the visit, I would, I would look at it in a, in a larger perspective and uh, a broader perspective and not necessarily uh, this one. I'm Pallavi Apte Nulkar and I'm part of the brewing startup culture in India. And I'm speaking from the perspective of the fact that today the w entire world recognizes Israel as the startup nation of the world. Uh, and uh, Israel is at the epicenter of the startup culture today. So uh, on behalf of all the young entrepreneurs, I wanted to convey the fact that we all look up to Israeli, uh, Israeli uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we look up to them uh, with respect uh, to learn, partner, and collaborate with them. And I wanted to know from you what is that secret recipe that the uh, Israeli entrepreneurs have that <laughs> Every business that they start up is always successful. Formula? Yeah. <laughs> You're very kind. Uh, I have to tell you one of the parameters, frankly speaking, one of the parameters of the very special ecosystem in Israel is the fact, for example, that the governmental help given to a startup in a very early stage of its, you know, when it even does not get pops out of the, of the shell of the egg is the risk that the government is taking, knowingly so, that maybe 14 out of 15, I think this is the ratio, will not succeed. So we take a risk. The government takes a risk. It, the government looks at, let's say, 400, uh, there is something like a, a tender or something like this in a particular year, so many hundreds of not companies, but inventors, entrepreneurs, scientists have an idea, a solution. They put it up to the government, and the government decides to take, let's say, 100 or 80 companies. And the government knows that part of the money allocated for the first jump start of this startup, uh, most of them will not succeed. That's a risk. This is part of the formula, if you wish or the ecosystem, and this ecosystem has a lot of, um, of ingredients. Some of the ingredients are uh, very special and unique uh, in Israel. For example, one, one of them has to do with the fact, uh, with the contribution of the army to the startup, um, to the startup um, uh, ecosystem, meaning that in the army, uh, many not everyone is a field soldier. There are many soldiers who are in labs or in units that have to deal with technology. And I would say entrepreneurship under uniform. And those young officers who do their two, three, four uh, years of uh, army service uh, at, at, at a very uh, early age have to deal with what an entrepreneur has to deal in other places. And they manage units, and they are director of 
20, 30, or 60 people, and they uh, invent a solution, and they develop a solution, and this solution is put to test. And then after a few years, those guys, those wonderful, smart guys, g girls and guys, uh, get out of the army service, and they start up their own startup, and they, put their, they contribute their experience at the age of 23, 24 to the ecosystem. So here is one more uniqueness. Another uniqueness is not, it's not only the government that um, takes risk. Uh, we all take risk and we are uh, ready, if I may say, ready to accept um, uh, failure. We do not, I mean, we want to succeed, but we do not want to succeed by all price. And failure is part, not part of the ecosystem, but it's part of something that we can absorb and, you know, and start again. Uh, another uh, ing ingredient of the ecosystem is the fact that uh, there's a very special uh, relationship uh, uh, in this ecosystem between government, academia, and each university in Israel has a company called the Transfer of Technology Company, which is exactly the buffer zone between academia and industry, venture capital, government, and I'm sure I've forgotten one or two elements in the ecosystem, but the ecosystem is a very special, uh, a very special one, very unique one. But we, it's not something that we, that we hide. I mean, it's something that is, is there. And, and part of what we're doing when we liaise uh, between us and, 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 and those who are interested, by the way, there is another very important element. We our government, and this is not connected to one specific startup, it's more of a policy, our government allocates a huge percentage to R&D. Something like 4% of our DG, G, GDP goes to R&D. That's one of the biggest uh, uh, in the world. So take into consideration that this very normal country is developing the ecosystem in uh, in the startup nation, also has to tackle the geopolitical uh, threats, the need to safeguard our borders, our people, to fight terrorism, a new kind of terrorism. Uh, complicated, much, much more complicated than before, uh, and to build the ecosystem, and we're very proud that we have succeeded. Now, um, you gave very good words about the Israeli uh, ecosystem, I have to say that the Indian uh, startup uh, system is also very well known throughout the world. Uh, we are looking for ways, uh, and it's not only for us to do it, it's for the companies themselves, the entrepreneurs, the, the, the initiators uh, uh, to, to, to do also, and uh, maybe we haven't done enough, all of us, in this, but this is something that, that is definitely on the table, and uh, uh, we will hear more about it uh, in the uh, foreseeable future, for sure. Uh, I would like to add from my own experience um, and maybe an anecdote that's uh, uh, connected directly with Pune. Um, I think and my uh, colleague from the consulate and I, I think was with me then, uh, I was invited to give a talk about the book Startup Nation, uh, which I recommend to all of you who are interested in the Israeli startup ecosystem to read. Uh, it's also a pretty entertain entertaining read, but I think it, it touches uh, most of the, or uh, basically the same points that the ambassador um, mentioned, but uh, you know, in, in a more in-depth way and comprehensive. Uh, but what really surprised me is that uh, I think, the, I don't remember which organization invited me to speak, BDB. Uh, prepared an, an auditorium of I think 150 people and we were amazed that uh, it was completely full and many people kind of stood in the back. Uh, so that I think mostly young people but not only here in Pune had a tremendous interest um, in this book and in this issue which I uh, see as an attestment to I think this possible connection and connectivity between the Israeli um, high-tech startup ecosystem and the ecosystem uh, here in India and maybe specifically in Pune. And this is something that we 
in the consulate in Mumbai, uh, and I try to come to Pune as much as I can, and this will continue uh, uh, after I leave as well, my predecessor, I'm sure. Uh, but to work on this connectivity in, in the uh, high-tech uh, startup culture, maybe through shared incubators, uh, visits, as was mentioned also by Dr. Firodia, uh, I believe that this is the best way to share this, but it's not just, I think, a regular um, connection between two regular countries. I think there is uh, a special bond here, and this brings me to my other experience or anecdote. I was also Consul General of Israel in uh, California, in Northern California and the uh, uh, Northwest uh, United States in San Francisco, and I was about 10 years ago, and I covered quite a lot the uh, high-tech industry in Silicon Valley, and what, what I could see there that between the different entrepreneurs from all over the world who are in Silicon Valley, the best connection was between Israeli and Indian entrepreneurs. And, uh, there, are quite, and there are quite a few examples of that, of uh, founders of very successful companies that uh, one of them was Israeli, one of them was Indian. So I think there's a complementing factor to that, and I saw it in Silicon Valley. I'm sure it can happen here uh, as well. And uh, we will keep on working on it. It's very high uh, on our agenda. Uh, and I think, and I'm very optimistic about the outcomes of this. Thank you. Without time, we'll have the last two uh, questions. Okay, One can, I, can I say something which please, is very connected to what please. the Consul General said? Now I understand why Prime Minister Netanyahu said a few, uh, maybe a year ago, he said that in Silicon Valley, the most uh, frequented uh, languages, so he probably heard it from you, <laughs> the most frequented <laughs> languages are uh, Hebrew and the Indian languages. <laughs> My name is Dr. George Judah. I've been a pilot. I've got course mates here. Uh, I'm Jewish. And I want to corroborate one statement that Mr. Abai Ferodia made. We have never been persecuted. My grandfather was in the army, father was in the army, and now I have done two PhDs and I'm the director of a management institute. And I have one request. I want Mr. Uh, Dr. Abai Ferodia to request the Israelis to start an academy of entrepreneurs which I'm ready to help you if you need my help. We must start an academy for entrepreneurs. I have been teaching in uh, many management institutes. There are a lot of people that are very creative, and we are wasting it. I've done my PhD in creativity. I had a lot of help from, I was in IIM Ahmedabad, so I got a lot of help there. Mr. Dr. Ferodia, I'm ready to say this, that I'm ready to join you. You make an academy for entrepreneurs with their help. I've seen it in Israel. Tell them to help us. I'm with you. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, uh, my yeah. name is Devang Banko. I'm a software engineer. Uh, uh, first of all, belated happy birthday to you. Last 25 years, there were only uh, President Wiesman, uh, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon's visit. In your tenure, both the presidents visited. Hopefully, both the prime ministers will be visiting. So that's uh, your most successful tenure. I have specific questions on the specific areas we didn't talk. Um, there are only four countries in the world who are non-signatory to NPT. India, Israel, North Korea, and Pakistan. So can we see some movement in nuclear cooperation between the two countries? Uh, <laughs> uh, second one is uh, regarding the <laughs> geopolitical, geopolitical arena. We have good relations with Israel. We have excellent relations with Iran. Chabahar is our gateway to Eurasian Russia. And we hopefully see that whenever there is a development in Jabbar, there are a lot of restrictions from US, Western world, Israel as well. So how do Israel see the economic en engagement between India, Iran, as Jabbar is our gateway to Eurasia and Afghanistan? And third one specifically regarding to Iran-Israel relationship. Um, Few months back, there was a message from Benjamin Netanyahu to the people of Iran that the state of Iran is the main culprit. The people of Iran are. I can hardly hear. Yeah. 
Um, and the president of Iran has uh, specified to the Revolutionary Guard stating that uh, the message, death to Israel, should not be printed on the missiles. Just signals, just signals. So do you see some kind of moving forward between Iran-Israel relationship? Because as I know, before the Islamic Revolution, there were nice relations between Israel and India. And finally, the question. Oh, there's still one more. Uh, let me skip the first question, if you, if you, will, uh, if you will allow me. If you will allow me. Uh, on the second question, um, uh, and maybe it coincides a bit with the third question. Uh, Iran is a big threat to my country. But not only to my country. Iran is a threat to the whole region. And if you would uh, ask an uh, Arab UAE, Egyptian, Jordanian, Saudi leader and diplomat, what's the biggest threat uh, that we face? Uh, Iran would be on the top of the agenda. And uh, we agree with that. We have seen Iran destabilizing our region. We have seen Iran uh, supporting terrorism. Uh, we see Iran helping terrorist organizations that are stationed around our borders. Iran is a far away country for Israel, but the Iranians are very near us, helping, training, uh, giving uh, capabilities, speaking about wiping my country out of the map, helping this happen denying the Holocaust and maybe preparing for the next one. So unfortunately, I, don't know, uh, I do not see any change in this uh, perspective and this policy. And Iran is a big threat to stability, a threat to my country, a threat to other countries. And I am I, I, sad to disappoint you, but no, I, I do not see any change. And I really don't see any signals. Uh, In two words, I'd like to try to answer part of the other question that you had, the previous one, the second question. Um, we do not, in our diplomatic engagement, we do not either teach or suggest <laughs> other countries how to um, maintain and how to manage their diplomatic relations. But I have to say that our Indian counterparts and the rest of the world with whom we have contacts and friendship and with on whom we can count and those who count on us know exactly what we feel about the threats to to our threats and uh, I'm sure that our Indian counterparts and colleagues at MEA and the government know exactly how we feel about uh, how we feel about Iran and the threat that Iran poses to Israel good evening your excellency a very small sharp uh, simple question you said that uh, almost 10% of students, foreign students studying in Israel are from India. My simple question is, how come? I had no idea, this is something I'm learning. Uh, how do they go there, what do they learn, what are the fields in which they're interested that uh, Israel offers them, and what do they come back to do here? I didn't know that there were so many. I don't know if your government gives scholarships to these students. You, you have been or you will be? Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Good. Tel Aviv. Yeah. So uh, one part of the ten percent is already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would not talk about numbers because if you look at the numbers of Indian students in Australia, UK, and the US, which are a little bigger than Israel, <laughs> and the capacity of the universities in those countries is a little bigger than in Israel. Uh, then the numbers maybe will not be very impressive, but the 10% I think is very, very impressive. It is the result of efforts done by universities. It is the result of mechanisms, speaking of mechanisms, of our uh, government, of uh, uh, scholarships, uh, training, um, uh, training in the academia. Uh, and it, it's also the result of the fact that Israel is an, attract, uh, an attractive destination and where 
Indian students are received with open arms. And this is something that we hear from Indians in general when they come back, especially those who have a chance to live for a few months or for a year uh, um, and, and, and study there. One particular, and again, it's, it wasn't in your question, but I'd like to put it as an answer. Uh, one uh, uniqueness um, of the Indian student, and they're studying agriculture, and, uh, and there they're, they're are postdoc in, in, in uh, agricultural institutions, and management of water, and uh, engineering, and mathematics, and uh, if we if we enlarge our cybersecurity uh, relationship, then you will have uh, disciplines related to cybersecurity. Um, one uniqueness of the Indian student as a generality is that, and this is good news, I think, for India, not I think, I'm sure, that the Indian student who studies in Israel comes back to India. Right. <laughs> friends, um, just, friends. Uh, I just want this question, just to add, I think it's an important point. Uh, the Israeli government is uh, giving, uh, or gave in the last um, five years or so, uh, 100 uh, postdoc uh, scholarships for um, postdoc students from either China or India. 80% of these 100 scholarships uh, go to Indian students. Uh, and that, I think, uh, is a bit, so that in itself is a part, and these are very advanced st students, uh, all of them um, postdoc. Uh, so that's just, I think, an example, and uh, the second point I wanted to add is um, hearing from uh, one of the heads of the Hebrew University, for instance, uh, that he said that the feedback he got from all of the uh, biosciences and chemistry labs uh, of the Hebrew University, and there are quite a lot of them, uh, that from their experience, the graduate students uh, from India who participate in the cutting edge uh, research, they do that there in the different laboratories. Uh, these are the best students, bare none, from anywhere in the world that they have. And I think that just shows the level of collaboration and again, the, um, uh, the really good tie-up between Israeli and uh, Indian um, uh, academia. Friends, uh, the ambassador was supposed to leave at 7.15, his other engagement. We already made him stay. I'm staying, 15, I'm staying. 15, 20 minutes longer than what his program is. So I think let's conclude. Uh, uh, if you permit, I'll give uh, a few remarks. Uh, first, uh, on my behalf and all of us behalf, I want to thank the amb ambassador for outstanding lecture and uh, on Indian uh, Israel. It was very illuminating, and we gained a lot. Uh, I think uh, when you think about Israel, it's a unique nation because very few nations can claim a civilizational heritage. Is a uh, Abrahamic civilization is a very unique civilization. The very few countries have this kind of civilization heritage. And uh, if I may say so, it's, uh, I've not done the calculation, but I remember uh, looking at some time back, it is highest per capita basis, highest number of patents. It's the most innovative patent. <laughs> it's the most innovative uh, country. It's, uh, it's a in terms of dynamic Technology is brilliant, the virtuosity is really, we, look, we can learn a lot, and I'm glad that you identified areas in which we can work together. Uh, let me talk to you, Mr. Ambassador, about this organization, because uh, uh, this is also in some ways a unique institution, because it's the only, as far as I know, the only think tank which is completely independent in the sense that it's financed entirely by the members themselves. Is not created by the government. It's not created by the private sector. It's not created by private sector meaning company. It's not created by foundation. So it's completely. Uh, there were 400 people came together and created this institution. We have brought out so far more than a dozen policy papers and briefs. And we, there are four, or five verticals that emerge as our 
work area. One is because our president is Dr. Bashankar, which is in this country considered a guru on innovation. So innovation, uh, including social innovation, is a very important part of our work. Second is uh, national security. We have organized a Pune Dialogue on National Security, which is annual. Our ambition is uh, it over here it should become international and hopefully as attractive to come as people go to either Munich or Shanghai Dialogue. Third area which really emerges in the area of urbanization and uh, energy and environment. We do a lot of work in this area. And finally, whole issue of development policies. So these are the sort of five, six areas and I think I have no doubt that there are a number of similar institutions in uh, Israel which could be per perhaps we can look forward to work with. We have uh, here Latika Pargaukar. She, is a, she organizes every year one of the most interesting, in this country, the most interesting film festivals. She had done two Buddhist film festivals. She had done festivals, film festivals of the countries from the Central Asia. So uh, we'll be very happy to and look forward to any cooperation in the organizing the Israeli films and in the future in terms of organizing film festivals. So uh, friends, uh, please join me to give a very warm hand to the distinguished ambassador for his <laughs> brilliant lecture. Hello. Uh, I guess there is only a minute between us and concluding the program, so if you allow me. First of all, uh, as you continue to clap, I'll be requesting Dr. Vijay Kilkar to, on behalf of all of us sitting here, to give a tiny token of appreciation to uh, His Excellency. So on behalf of all of us, and the claps could be a lot louder than they have ever been. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's also an honor that uh, that Mr. David Akov has joined us today. So may I also request Dr. Abhay Firodia to, uh, uh, to give a tiny token of appreciation to uh, the Council General. Thank you, Dr. Firodia. Uh, I, must, uh, I must thank uh, many people, but to begin with, uh, I must thank Mr. Sudhir Mehta, and if you could continue to clap, because thanks to him, we could organize this program today. As Dr. Kelkar was mentioning, it's very interesting in PIC. So many people ask us, how many people work? So how does this operate if you organize four or five of this program every month? Uh, the wonders are there in all the PIC members. While they would be journalist, scientist, economist in their respective field and the industrialist, when they come to PIC, they come as volunteer and they contribute as much in making all of this happen. So it's not the PIC office, it's thanks to people like Sri Sudhir Mehta on this occasion and many other people sitting here who make different things possible. So thank you so much for that, Mr. Mehta. Uh, I must also thank uh, very, very young students first, the young and bright ones uh, and the last rows. Some of them had to go for their rows, I understand, uh, in time. But I really, really thank the young and bright ones because most of Pune is you people. Uh, if I could just indulge in, in literally 30 seconds, uh, uh, my view on some of you on the social media, right? For all that I heard from Ambassador today, if you have to just put some hashtags, right? It will mean hashtag on security, hashtag healthcare, hashtag education, hashtag startups, hashtag agriculture, hashtag water, and hashtag R&D. I guess that sums up many, many of metadatas meta on whole lot that's happening in Israel and whole lot that we were willing to learn and we are wanting to learn. But that aside, uh, coming to uh, my vote of thanks, I'm really, really thankful to the representatives of media as well. It's thanks to you people that we take out the message, not just for the 200 of us here, but also a lot many people outside. So thank you so much for coming and covering this program. That's very, very important. I thank each and every one of you who are sitting here, and I thank especially the, uh, the office of uh, the ambassador as well as office of PIC and office of Mr. Firodia who all helped us to make this happen. Thank you so much and see you again at PIC. Thank you. <laughs>